All right, kids, break out your pocket protectors and your dice bag. We're ready to game. <laughs> For evil. Dun, dun, dun. It's D&D, &D, and it's become popular with children anywhere from grammar school on up. Not so with a lot of adults who think it's been connected to a number of suicides and murders. What is the B-list? What is the B-list? What's the B-list? What's the B-list? What's the B-list? What's What's the B -list? B -list? What if I told you that gaming was a tool of the devil? Encouraged sorcery was a recruitment tool for satanic cults and was linked to madness and suicide. Crazy, right? Oh, 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 you thought the idea that gaming was the root of all evil was a new idea, didn't you? <laughs> before Anita Sarkeesian, before Jack Thompson, there was a rogues gallery of nut jobs, wackos, and fanatics out to end gaming. Or, well, end the godfather of gaming. Dungeons and Dragons. Cast your mind back, dear listeners, to the Dark Ages, the time before time, the 80s. <coughs> yeah, the 80s. I could go on for hours on the influence of that one game on gaming as we know it, but let's move on. Because let's face it, it, yeah, there's a whole podcast on its, on its own on that, and that's not what this is about. Now, let me pull you back to the 80s. We have to remember that at the time, well, a lot of things were going on, and if you may remember, there's some controversy about heavy metal music, some controversy about Kiss, Black Sabbath, a bunch of other stuff like that. It's a long story. And also, there was some, some stress, I suppose you could say, in regards to uh, satanic cults. Uh, to call it a panic might be overstating it just a tiny bit, but if you were part of the Christian community at the time, it was a serious matter. Looking back on it, it all seems terribly ridiculous now. But we know a great we knew a great deal less then than we know now. So there you are. Now, where does D and D fit into this? Where is our Anita Sarkeesian, our Jack Thompson? Well, the closest we're going to get is a an almost tragic character uh, known as Patricia Pulling. Patricia Pulling was a sad sad figure really um i despite the the near fatal damage she did to the gaming industry i don't i actually kind of feel sorry for her Matt and lee pulling and their 12 year old daughter melissa the pullings came home one night three years ago and found bink their son dead on the front lawn of their home in montpelier virginia he had shot himself through the heart with his father's handgun until that night they had never heard of the game dungeons and dragons Mrs. Pulling was a relatively religious woman uh, who formed, <clears throat> and I wish I was kidding about this, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, it was called Bad. This was her bad idea. But the nucleus of this idea was her son, Irving, committed suicide. Now, there's no circumstance under which a parent loses their child and retains their sanity relative to whatever it is, uh, at least for a little bit. I, everybody recovers from grief differently. I know that Miss Pulling is, is gone, but if anyone who's related to her thinks that I am demonizing her as a bad person and not, at least I'm taking a moment to acknowledge her significance and what had to be a heart-wrenching loss, and then reaching for an explanation. I'll give Miss Pulling this. At least she had a more understandable reason for attacking gaming than the two self-aggrandizing weirdos and hucksters who came after her. Now, uh, by the way, on a side note, it's not to say that Pulling was the only person who ever did this, but she's the, the hero of the story, so to speak. So... Uh, her son, uh, Pulling's son Irving, was an active D&D player, and she believed that uh, the suicide had something to do with the game. Rumor has it, and I suppose she believed it, that shortly before he committed suicide, um, he had been playing a D&D game, and his character was cursed. So this had something to do with his suicide. I don't know if that's actually true or not. I haven't found any anything specific. Um, but her first 
effort was to sue the high school principal that allowed the game to be played on campus, apparently, and, and TSR itself, which is the original company that owned D&D. &D. But, but fortunately, TSR and the school uh, won the suit and because the, the courts were having none of that. After those cases were dis dismissed, she founded uh, BAD. In a way that would be very familiar to us now, Patricia somehow got herself as an expert on the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons in the media and the general hullabaloo about satanic cults and their connections to strange things, including, you know, uh, rock music and D&D. Because you have to understand that gaming as we know it even the very terminology is something that is grossly unfamiliar to people at the time. So let me let me give you an idea. Hold on, I'm going to read something here. This is a bit of a, bro a brochure from TSR Hobbies, you know, back then. I'm going to read that, and then I'm going to read this guy's reaction. While one of the participants creates the whole world in which the adventure is to take place, the balance of the players, as few as two or as many as a dozen or more, create characters who will travel about in this make-believe world. Interact with its peoples and seek the fabulous treasures of magic and precious items guarded by dragons, giants, werewolves, and hundreds of other fearsome things. The game organizer, the participant who creates the whole and mo the whole and moderates these adventures, is known as the dungeon master or DM. The other players have personae, fighters, magic users, thieves, clerics, elves, dwarves, or what have you, who are known as player characters. Player characters have known attributes which are initially determined by rolling the dice. These attributes help define the role and limits of each character. There is neither an end to the game nor any winner. Each session of play is merely an episode in an ongoing world. And here's the action. This is what the cave sounds like when it speaks to outsiders. This is what the cave sounds like when it speaks to outsiders. Its diction is erudite and occasionally awkward. Treasures of magic? It uses game terms as though their meaning will be obvious. What are attributes? And it raises many questions as it, as it answers. Uh, you, have, you who have never played could be forgiven for asking, what are the rules of D&D? If no one wins, how do you know if you're playing well? Where's the board? Okay, listen up. There is no board. You play a character, as in theater. You don't actually act out the character's words or deeds. Rather, you communicate about your character with the other players and with the dungeon master, whose job it is to speak for the world. And it goes on a bit. But you get a, this gives you an idea of what it was like before gaming became mainstream. Even the, the, the most fairly simple terminology is completely lost on your average person. The very idea of these sorts of games was alien. So this may give you a bit of a window into the difference between our world now where uh, someone like Anita, Anita Sarkeesian or Jack Thompson speaks about gaming and everyone knows what they're talking about. Even if they've never played it, they've seen someone do it. And they, the basic gist of how video games and other games work is familiar to them in a sense of, like, you're the nerd who's never played football, but you know how roughly how it works. That kind of thing. That whole world that we live in now, completely absent. This stuff was a total mystery to them. And it was something practiced by people. Well, you think you think gamers get uh, get a negative rep for being nerds in the nerds in their mom's basements now? Jesus Christ! The vast majority of people who played D and D back in the day were people who were you know real serious nerds, not the pretend nerds, not the hipsters who who wear the you know the the uh, slightly ironic but um, trying to join in on the old fandom uh, street cred sort of sort of motherfuckers. No. These are people who really checked their their pride at the door to some extent and got along and involved in fantasy uh, stories with people who were into the same things. We're talking about people who were deeply into fantasy novels and maybe war game simulation. There was a, there was a bridger between people who were primarily interested in the milita military type stuff and, and then bridger with people who were interested and fantasy type stuff, and that's where all this stuff comes from. But that's another story. So enter Patricia Pulling. Her son dies, and he was into something that she had so little understanding of that she honestly thought that a curse on a character in a game might have had some negative effect on her son. 
Now, for a confused, troubled, and downright traumatized parent, you can understand how that might have happened. And eventually, she took this as a crusade of sorts, a jihad, <laughs> if you will, and took to basically demonizing it. And because the interest in the press was very large, she basically just got latched, up, latched upon, I think, as the opposing voice to a game which nobody understood. And it was easy to demonize because we didn't have any idea what the fuck it was. And to give an idea of how delusional she was, we're talking about things where she actually suggested perhaps that police take it seriously if character's name was similar to things in occult works, even if they're fictional. She also made serious mistakes like you know, con concluding that maybe 4% of adults and 4% of teenagers were in uh, satanic cults. And that meant that there was 8% of the people in the area in satanic cults. Uh, look, even for a robot, I'm not particularly good at math, and I got that, that there's a problem with that. But all of that stuff really basically led to a, 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 a round of hysteria and a scare about Dungeons & Dragons that, again, today it seems ridiculous. And I hope, I really hope, that someday in the future the whole thing, Arnita Sarkeesian uh, seems as ridiculous as this. And Jack Thompson, to a great extent, has uh, come to this sort of sort of end as well. He's a joke. But like, we'll go on for just a little bit longer. Other examples of just the lunacy that gets involved here. For instance, Bad, well, really just pulling was... A, well, pulling was a one-woman show. Bad was really just her. Uh, but in the, in the process of publishing, she you know, tried to put warning labels on the game. And... There was an article, yeah, it's cited here, where in the process of writing about this, the press, the press just dug it. They ate it up. In the same way that uh, the press will bring on uh, Anita Sarkeesian now, or Jack, Jack Thompson in his time, and breathlessly listen to some of the most intense bullshit you have ever heard in your life. They did this for anyone who had something interesting and negative to say about D&D. &D all the time. For instance, there was a, an article by a Dr. Tam Thomas Radecki. I'm probably horribly mispronouncing his name. But he says, Dungeons and Dragons is essentially a worship of violence, said Dr. Thomas Radecki of Campaign. Blah, 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 blah. A psychiatrist and chairman of the National Coalition of Television Violence in Washington, D.C. Wow, see a theme here? It's a very intense war game. Talk to people that have played it. It's very fascinating. It's a game of fun. But when you have fun with murder, that's dangerous. When you make a game out of war, that's harmful. If you make a game out of human sacrifice, eating babies, drinking blood, rape, murder of every variety, curses of insanity, it's just a very violent game. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, what were these assholes playing? Fatal? Jesus. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, wow. And what I'm kind of getting at here is that uh, while I've chosen Pulling as our hero of the story, uh, sort of our archetype, uh, because unlike a lot of the other people that were involved in demonizing Dungeons & Dragons, she was the least sympathetic. Again, what the tragic loss of your child at a relatively young age could would do to a person, I can only imagine. This is not a small thing. But there were some less than... Uh, sympathetic characters involved here, and some of which were just plain stupid. So I'm going to go over briefly a few of the other things that happened around the same time, just to kind of give you a perspective. Enter William Fuck! Another difficult name I can't pronounce. Fuck it. William <laughs> uh, apparently one time claimed that he was for, used to be a Wiccan priest as well as a Satanic priest. Which, for those of you who know anything about Wicca, um, may become immediately aware that there's something smells about that, because their veneration is completely different. <laughs> but anyway, but from, from in the 80s to the to the not the the uh, the novice hell, even today you could probably you could briefly get away with that in the in the really ignorant communities. Now, mind you, I'm not a religious person myself, but Jesus Christ, I mean, you know, lies are lies. But he said, after eschewing those faith, he dedicated himself to encouraging others to avoid them as well. And he wrote an article at Chick Publications. I, I wish I was kidding. 
There was an article he he, uh, he said, In the late 70s, a couple of game writers actually came to my wife and I as prominent sorcerers in the community. They wanted to make certain the rituals were authentic, and for the most part, they are. <laughs> I don't know about you, but... <laughs> <clears throat> Look, okay, here's the funny thing. I, I actually kind of understand where he might have gotten this idea, but it sure as hell isn't from D&D. If you know anything about D&D, the spells are cartoonishly silly. The closest you get to anything that might even be considered magic is that certain things have some uh, have material components that have something to do with what they're doing. For instance, some illusion spells require a, a bit of wool. You know, as in pulling the wool over your... Yeah, okay. If that's authentic, then this is pathe- then this is pathetic. But honestly, I've known some genuine believers in magic, and I've seen a few role-playing games that have what you could, at a casual glance, think might have something to do with, with real-world magic, but doesn't. I'll give you an example here. This is Palladium Fantasy. Kevin said, media, leave me alone. This is a legitimate discussion. He's notorious for doing copyright nonsense. Anyway. So, there. Sure, fine. Okay. Also, um, another, just another example is uh, Tracy Hickman, who actually wrote some of the, uh, the some D&D novels. I actually had some, <laughs> some goofy stuff to say about it, but really side comedy by comparison. No, the fun thing that I'd like to end this video on to talk about that I think you'll all find pretty entertaining is mazes and monsters. Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about that Tom Hanks movie. Well, not really. So here's the real story. James Dallas Egbert III, uh, August 15th, 1979. So yes, this actually predates the the, uh, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons stuff, but eh. it's not as interesting a story. Well, it is in its own way, but not, you know, anyway. On August 15th, 1979, after writing a suicide note, Egbert leaves his dormitory room at Case Hall and entered the uh, the Michigan State University steam tunnels. Uh, supposedly, he consumed some stuff in temp- attempting to commit suicide, and it didn't go well. He woke up the next day and then went into hiding at a friend's house. This is where things get weird. The police start searching for Egbert. The story was followed pretty widely on the news. Well, it's starting with the, the newspaper for the university, university's newspaper, and then got some details flooded in, and Egbert's parents hired a private investigator, William Deer. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why this story is not about Deer, because one, this isn't, isn't quite as, as interesting, I suppose. But again, we have to remember, back then, just like anyone else, he didn't know hardly anything about uh, fantasy role-playing games. Um, he theorized that Egbert's disappearance to the media and to uh, his parents, he theorized that the, the D&D might have had something to do with the whole thing. Never mind, you know, stories about drug use, school pressure, who knows what else, okay? I mean, he was in, he was in college at the age of 16, I believe. So, yeah, <clears throat> pressure, just a little bit. And in fact, uh, they actually uh, do a sort of a hat tip to that in uh, Real Genius. So, well, this guy was troubled, so I don't want to focus on Egbert per se because this really isn't about. Him. Anyway, uh, the short, the long and the short of it is that Egbert, by uh, by you know, staying at his friend's house and then other means, evaded you know uh, discovery for several weeks. Eventually, he was he was found by deer, as I understand it. I could be wrong about it. It's a bit fuzzy. Where this goes into the weird territory is that Deer's speculation. He claims just. Spec- wild speculation was taken as as fact by the media and just run they ran with as though he had had not actually um, meant to do that. But I don't know. After the fact, uh, you know, deer may be covering his ass. It was again, I suppose, a case of a tragic situation that got blown all out of proportion by being connected to a, connected to a game that literally had nothing to do with it. Uh, somewhat in the aftermath of this, a uh, fine fellow named Michael Stackpole wrote an article about this and noted one thing, amongst others, is that of the age group and type of people who played D&D at the time, actually the suicide rate for gamers was actually lower than normal, uh, lower than average, and as well as you know all kinds of other uh, you know negative behaviors such as crime, acting out, you know, general rule-breaking, rule breaking whatnot, 
I mean, we were talking about nerds. Uh, nowadays, gaming is such an almost all-pervasive thing that virtually everyone games in some fashion or another. And whether we know it or not, we owe an immense amount of what gaming is, the way it works, and how things operate to Dungeons and & Dragons. And I'll be honest with you, back in the day, I was not a big fan. I actually sort of finally climbed on board and became a D&D uh, nerd or fan in 3rd uh, edition. Prior to that, I really didn't like the rules very much. The setting was nice, the, the whole idea was cool, but honestly, I was a Traveler guy. Traveler, Mechton, a whole bunch of other stuff. But let's face it, there were better games to play, in my opinion. But despite that, I think we as gamers owe Dungeons & Dragons an immense debt. And the fact that it survived, what, at the time, again, it seems ridiculous now, but at the time, it was a serious assault on the hobby. So serious that they, the 60 Minutes at one point drug uh, pulling and Gygax onto TV to talk about it. On, lot, on national television to talk about this. What was at the time a very, very small hobby. But it was mysterious to people. Strange and weird. Ironically, now that it's almost all pervasive and a bigger industry than the movies, now it's got a different attention of a different sort and a different level of influence. But again, it's still, what about our children? I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of uh, this from uh, the 60 Minutes thing, uh, just because I thought it would be entertaining to kind of look at, at sort of back through the lens of what gaming used to be. And, oh yeah, by the way, I'm a, and, and if anyone is going to argue that video games and games are something completely different, yes, I understand that. But back then, video games were pretty primitive. But anyway, here's some old school gaming. Roll them dice. Roll that footage. About two months ago, a green eyeball was seen up in the sky. This eyeball was so big, it blotted out the sun, okay? I've never that? seen dice like this. All different sides. What, Six sided. What's the what's the point it, in that? What, what's it? they're for uh, different things. The four sided is used mainly for damage from a dagger and dart, and magic users hit points. Hit points is the damage that you can take before you die. 